Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and with me now is someone I've wanted to interview for a very long time. Her name is Dr. Eva Detko, and she is a natural healthcare practitioner, speaker, and author of The Sovereign Health Solution, Heal the Psychoenergetic Root Causes of Chronic Illness. She's studied natural medicine and the human mind for 23 years. And she successfully recovered from chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and reversed Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She now helps others recover their health. She has extensive knowledge and experience in the field of human physiology, biochemistry, nutritional sciences, and bioenergetics. She also uses a wide range of mind transforming modalities, including havening techniques, brain working recursive therapy, hypnotherapy, mindfulness, NLP, transactional analysis, and applied psychoneuroimmunology. So welcome to the show, Dr. Detko. Such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks very much for having me, Ari. Lovely to talk to you. Yes. So first of all, I'm, I'm very curious what your personal story is. Obviously, in your bio, it talks about what I just read, the fact that you uh, recovered from chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and Hashimoto's. Was that something that sparked your interest in studying health and got you started on the journey, and then you became interested in the mind as a result of your own personal experience? Or I'm, I'm just curious, what, what is your sort of personal story of how you got into this? Yes, that's, that's exactly right. Right, and that's very similar to a lot of people in the field, isn't it not? Um, yet really, uh, when you have such a profound experience and transformation with something, you then obviously automatically want to share it with other people. So I, I did have a lot of trauma as a, as a child, really the, the birth trauma, the pregnancy and birth were very traumatic um, for me personally. This is a case for a lot of people. And that's certainly uh, the big part of uh, where it all sort of went wrong. <laughs> Obviously, we, we know there's intergenerational trauma, ancestral trauma, there's epigenetic influences. But really, a lot of those things are not talked enough um, about. But also, what people don't appreciate is that if you have uh, this compromised start in life that I did, my mother's pregnancy, the reason why it was traumatic is because her sister died um, of a vaccine injury when my mother was only three months pregnant with me. Mm. And so she was plunged into grief, extreme grief. She was only 22. She was very young. Uh, we, you know, they didn't have coping tools and the fantastic neuroscience based tools to deal with trauma that we have now. Right. That, that was almost 50 years ago. So you need to appreciate that people were just talked to you know, just pretty much get on with it and, and not, uh, not bother a, a anybody. But what was interesting about that time is that she developed toxemia of pregnancy. So I lost my twin. A twin didn't make it. I barely made it. She nearly died. It was very, very traumatic. And of course, when I was born, again, I was born into this atmosphere of, on the one hand, this extreme joy that there is this new baby. He's going to um, and I was the first grandchild, so who's going to fill this void that my aunt's death left behind. But at the same time, there was still a lot of grief that people were dealing with. So even though the, the first initial moment of thriving in, on this realm, right, I obviously I can't say that I, I didn't have a lot of affection and love because I did everything, everybody poured their love and affection into me. And in a way, I, I really believe that that was my saving grace. But at the same time, I was born into this extreme confusion from the emotional perspective and energetic perspective. And of course, because of the pregnancy being compromised, I was very, I was a weakling, you know, I was really physiologically um, compromised too, not just emotionally confused, but physiologically, my body was just, you know, needed to catch up quite a bit uh, to the sort of normal development. And I was, I had all, all sorts of things, like lots of chest infections and rheumatoid issues, like as a kid, right? So it started already when I was young, because I remember being in and out of a rheumatologist uh, office when I was 
something like eight years old. And I was treated for thyroid issues when I was seven or eight years old. I remember just always being at the doctor. Wow. Uh, but as we know, and I, I know you, you talk about this stuff a lot, your listeners are obviously quite um, people who are quite savvy when it comes to health and health solutions. And, and there will there will be no surprise here that the physiological aspect is obviously connected to everything else and and so that's why i always talk about this one system that is the energetics the the mental the psychological the biochemical right and so you know this constant separation by the conventional medicine world obviously drives me crazy and so um that that it just doesn't work it doesn't work that approach doesn't work because we need to treat it as one system it's a very complex system everything within the system affects everything else and for sure in terms of then going forward how i was how my system was set for um for threat for trauma for just generally uh, my nervous system was completely dysregulated my hp axis was completely dysregulated all of that down the line contributed to things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue right so when then it came to healing however it was obviously like i just said everything affects everything else so all this physiological stuff still stands and it's still very very important but for me the the early traumas the fact that i recovered really i owe it to trauma work without any shadow of a doubt because by the time i got those different issues like the, the chronic fatigue particularly and fibromyalgia at that time i was already doing loads of nutritionally aware things like being gluten-free i've already been doing that so it wasn't really so much that it really was diving deep into the trauma work and also movement. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is for people who have a trauma, particularly something like bullying or uh, sexual abuse or things like that, trauma that really goes into the tissues, um, the movement and myofascial release, all of that, that is also a very important element of recovery, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to put a pin in that and come back to it. Um, one of the things that you were just talking about is the mind-body connection. And this is framed in a way that, I mean, even the way that I just phrased it, you would probably object to, to say mind-body connection. It's, it's rather, it's one system. But the, it's, it's amazing to me to think about how much one's worldview or paradigm influences what one perceives they're working with. So for example, um, conventional medicine often looks at what they're doing as, you know, disease processes that are the result of various biochemical abnormalities or biochemical mechanisms that have gone awry in some way. And now we need to use drugs to intervene in these pathological mechanisms to correct them. You know, the, so Sarah, so depression is, uh, you know, framed in psychiatry as a chemical imbalance and, and most uh, psychiatric issues are treated as, are, are viewed from the paradigm of these are chemical imbalances and we need a drug to intervene to correct the imbalance that's there. Um, the classic thing in conventional medicine is more, uh, you know, cholesterol is, is contribute high levels of cholesterol and LDL and triglycerides are contributing to uh, heart disease, atherosclerosis, and uh, we need to use statin drugs to reduce the this this you know cholesterol that is high for no good reason, um, and on and on and on. We could talk about a hundred other examples of things like that. Um, and then even in psychology and clinical psychology, which I've done an entire uh, all the coursework for a PhD program in that I've done all three years of coursework for my for my PhD in, in clinical psychology, and it's amazing to me to witness how siloed they are, uh, just like psychiatry, and how reductionistic they are in, in the sense of treating psychological issues purely as psychological, uh, as originating from psychological things. So that, so the solution, whether you have depression or anxiety or bipolar or whatever, uh, is 
to address the psychology of that to do talk therapy and how disconnected that is from even the existing body of evidence that we have around uh, nutritional interventions, sleep hygiene and circadian rhythm interventions, that, that we know those things impact on these mental or psychological disorders. And yet, because they're operating in a paradigm of, you know, psychological problems require psychological solutions, they don't connect to those bodies of literature. So you've got psychiatry prescribing drugs to fix, fix chemical imbalances, and you've got psychology prescribing talk therapy to fix uh, you know, psychological abnormalities that they think are originate purely from psychological things, but it's also disconnected from the broader picture of this being one system where all of the physical and biochemical stuff interplays with the psychological. So I'm curious how you paint that picture of, you know, what, what, what is your paradigm when it comes to sort of conceptualizing the mind body stuff? I call it, and it's very true. May I just actually add another aspect? Functional sure. medicine, it's all about the gut. It's all about the gut. Uh -huh. Well, what's messed up the gut? Like, let's ask the question because why do people, so why isn't everybody uh, in that same boat? Um, and, you know, we can obviously talk about the, the many, many um, root causes that obviously contribute to disease. And I'm not saying gut is not an issue. It is an issue, right? And when it comes to immunity, also, it is an issue. We know that. However, how is it that people end up with those microbiome issues with leaky gut, with all of this stuff, right? What's the actual cause behind that? Because the gut is definitely not the ultimate root cause. I mean, come on, right? So we could literally go so far back and i was talking to uh, master ming tong go actually the other day and we were saying like literally you could like go well what's the root cause of that okay but, but what's the root cause of that but what's the, and it can go on and on right yeah. and like i said you know you can talk about ancestral trauma like things that is in the field you know all this stuff that is in in the uh, uh the epigenetic stuff but also like literally the stuff in the in our subtle field so you can really go on and on about that um but my, my um, primary sort of like model from which I operate, if you like, is what I call the triangle of healing. So people have like different ways of describing the different pillars of health. Um, so, but I, I go with the uh, mental, emotional, the psychoenergetic, spiritual, and then obviously the physical, that includes structural stuff. And really what I talk about uh, to my to my clients and my programs in my book is that you cannot um, remove any of those okay so they're, they're always going to be pieces in your healing it's just a question of obviously how big those pieces are but when it comes to the um, particularly the nervous system dysregulation and the emotional stuff what I call emotional toxicity I have never ever met anybody with chronic manifestations that would be, you know, somebody who'd be chasing their symptoms for a long period of time who wouldn't have a degree of that. And so then it's just a question of how big a piece is that for you? Because for me, it was a giant piece, right? For somebody else, this may be a smaller piece. But of course, then we're looking at why is that relevant? It's relevant because if you come into this world uh, well, like I did, obviously, like I just said, with um, already a heightened um, emotional response, like set for, uh, for fight or flight, because my pregnancy wasn't safe and my birth wasn't safe. So already I have so many more glucocorticoid receptors. My nervous system is already like set for fight or flight or even freeze, possibly. And already what that does is that sets you up for subsequent trauma. It makes it easier for you to be traumatized. And so then all of those different things that happen in childhood with all the attachment um, issues, which are just so, so easy, it's so easy to screw up a child, even if you're like the most wonderful, meaning loving parent, because you're not inside the child's body 
And it really counts how the child perceives. It doesn't really matter that as a parent, you think like, oh, I think I'm looking after my child, okay? You know, they're being fed, they're fed and I'm giving them this and that and the other. Really, if the child doesn't think that the needs are being met, none of that matters. It's really just an internal perspective. And so all of those layers, there's so many layers. And then of course, the big one is the social engineering. I mean, wow, right? So all of the different um, things that are like put on children in terms of the expectation, things they should or shouldn't do, things they should or shouldn't feel, blah, 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 all of that. There are just so many of those layers that 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 is so that easy to just tip that nervous system balance over and so ultimately health is about spending most of your time in this ventral vagus activation right the ORS digest detoxify and heal but look at what, what's going on around us like most people are the opposite they'll spend most of their time even in their sleep oftentimes, as we know, right, it's a lot of people with sleeping issues, and they will be activating those survival states chronically. So there's no issue with activating survival states. There is an issue if they're activated chronically, and they really change the biochemistry, they change the neurochemistry. So you could be approaching healing from so many different angles, but I always think, what can we do to like tick as many boxes as we can, like quickly. So the person's body can start getting into homeo uh, body, mind, so everything gets into homeostasis and actually is able to heal. And through the many, many, many years that I've been doing this for, not through only my own experiences, but working with so many people, when you address um, particularly the early trauma, and also um, the belief systems, because obviously the particularly the early attachment stuff really impacts on our identity and it most certainly impacts on our, on our value and belief systems. And when we address that, it just seems like that's a big domino piece. So whether it is to do with just healing from chronic illness or even to be quite honest with you, achieving more optimal levels of health because some people just view health as an absence of disease, but you know, I'm sure you agree that to us that we can go a lot higher than that. There is such a thing as an optimal level. Most people, when they're sick, they're just satisfied with just like, you know what, if I just get rid of the symptoms, I'll be happy. But there's so much further you can go. And I really don't think that you can get there without addressing some of those like chronic emotional conflicts and those push and pull that you've got in your head or this what I call emotional toxicity right so that's that's kind of how I approach it like how can we get people on that healing path as quickly as possible and you know what you talk a lot about sleep circadian rhythm it's like the basic that's actually just absolute basics right um but of course as we know emotional toxicity can really get in the way of people's sleep. And I've got a ton of people with insomnia and a lot of them have unresolved trauma, right? So it's all, it kind of, you see how we all just connect together and you just really can't separate those things. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some of the, the key signs or symptoms that would clue somebody into how big of a piece it is for them, this emotional toxicity is? Like, are, are there any are sort of classic signs or symptoms that would lead one to think, oh, maybe, maybe these chronic symptoms I have are the result of unresolved trauma and emotional toxicity? Yeah, the reason why I like to talk about symptoms, because when you talk to people just purely about trauma, a lot of people think like, nah, I don't have any traumas, right? And of course, like I said, you could have just a chain of micro, micro traumas when you were little and literally you wanted more cuddles and your mother was too busy to give you those cuddles and bang, you've got attachment trauma mm. or something like that, right? But that's one example that can totally happen and often does. 
But if we talking, if we just talk to people about trauma and they don't have a broad enough understanding of trauma, they'll be like, yeah, I don't think that's, that's a thing for me, right? But when you start talking about those, some of those emotional toxicity symptoms, things such as chronic fears, chronic anxieties, guilt and shame, that's a big one, chronic guilt, chronic shame. There is such a thing as healthy guilt and healthy shame, but most people, <laughs> trust me, suffer from unbelievable, crazy amounts of chronic guilt and chronic shame, totally unjustified, and they just keep beating themselves up. So those symptoms, when you beat yourself up, when you keep fighting it, you know, with yourself in your head, so you have different parts to your psyche, and it's a very interesting thing to get into because you, you, people will find that those different parts of the psyche are often having those arguments and fights, right? And so it feels very much like people are literally feel like they're having a fight going on inside their head. Well, that's emotionally toxic. Why is that a problem? Because it triggers fight or flight. So even though it may not seem to you like uh, having uh, an anxiety about something or having social anxiety or having ruminating thoughts or overthinking, overanalyzing, overwhelm, even when people desensitize to that, because that's very often the case, right? People will often tell me, but that's how I've always been. I've always been like that. All right, well, just because you've desensitized and now you feel like you've always been that way, doesn't mean that you're not triggering your autonomic nervous system to be in this survival state. And then collectively, when you spend too much time in those survival states, you're not gonna heal because it's the, 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 the part of the nervous system that enables you to heal is completely disengaged when you spend so much time in those survival states. So that's why this is relevant. And I mentioned the ventral vagus, the rest digest, detoxify, heal. We really need to engage that readily and uh, frequently enough to be able for the, the healing processes, the regeneration, the repair of tissues and all of that to be able to take place. So when you have all of those uh, things, like I said, like the emotional conflicts, chronic guilt, chronic anger, chronic fears, chronic shame, chronic guilt uh, and all of that. And then, um, like I said, the, the ones that, uh, people often uh, don't really appreciate enough is things like overthinking, overanalyzing, really living up here, not connecting to the body, like really disconnected from emotions, disconnected from the body. That's another one. Um, being a doormat, you know, because that's another patient. That's another patient to trauma in, uh, in your early years. Uh, perfectionism, right? Another one, right? So, so when you talk in those terms, we're like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no, I, I do have this problem, right? And so then, then you can go, okay, right, let's see where that's coming from. Because the reason why I call them symptoms is because they're just symptoms of something else that in itself, not a thing. Anxiety is not a thing. You know, they've got those crazy labels right now. I had a bit of a rant on the mental health summit when I was doing my presentation about the fact that we've got like a, each month, like we've got a new health, mental health issue label, like, like generalized design, anxiety disorder and ODD and DDD, oh, like whatever Ds, you know, like standing for disorder. That's to me, I'm sorry. That's utterly ridiculous because a lot of those people, if I have them in practice, within a few sessions of therapy, they're good to go. They don't have that problem anymore, okay? So we don't wanna label people and burden them with this label. And now they think, oh shit, now I have this problem. Now I have to live with this problem. Now it's, it's becoming part of my life. Oh, well, if that's part of my life, then it's, it's becoming part of my identity. That's actually quite damaging because the moment that you have this, um, and poor self-worth, by the way, is emotionally toxic, right? But the moment you have people attaching to those labels, you have a much harder job of fixing it because now we're going to the core of the onion. You know, everybody's stuff, emotional stuff, mental stuff is like this onion. We often hear that analogy, right? And you've got loads and loads and loads and loads of layers your self-worth, your identity is the very core of that onion. So if you start affecting it by attaching to some, you know, some labels that somebody's just 
came like they came up with it like last month and now suddenly oh it's a big thing and you need medication for it i mean i'm sorry i mean is it me i mean i think that's pretty crazy no i agree with you completely yeah as someone who has studied the dsm and you know has gone through and had to memorize the details of hundreds of such diagnoses i completely agree with you um so what can be done about this? Let's, let's shift into the practical solutions aspect of this. How, from, from your paradigm of how you think about what's causing emotional toxicity, how it acts in the body. Actually, you know what? I want to step back. Uh, and before we get to the practical solutions, I have one thing I want you to comment on because you've commented a few times about people being in a, a stressed um, aspect of their, their nervous system. You've also alluded to the ventral vagal system. And so you're, you're kind of talking about uh, polyvagal theory, um, mm -hmm. Stephen Forges's polyvagal uh, hypothesis of how the nervous system operates. And um, I've seen that kind of come under attack in recent years. There's been several people that have attempted to debunk it, or, you know, I, I read an article just last week from a uh, um, psychologist, I believe, who was saying, you know, the polyvagal theory is dead and uh, that she was basically saying, you know, this pains me because I practiced for many years kind of um, from this model of thinking and it just is not accurate based on this, this and this. Um, anyway, I, I assume that you've encountered some of those kinds of articles or, or positions. Um, but do you have any thoughts on the polyvagal theory and, and how that fits into your, uh, into what you're doing and any thoughts on the criticisms of it? Yeah, no, I could say a lot of things are dead, but if I say that, what am I actually bringing to the table? On what basis am I saying that? Because from my work and from what I'm seeing with people, if I apply it, at least a rough model, and I'm not really honestly, quite honestly, I, even though I like physiology, don't get me wrong, I do like physiology, and I can geek out on physiology, but from the point of view of working with an individual, if I get that individual to heal, help them heal their traumas, and now they're just generally like taking a breather, and now the whole system is more relaxed, they're going to start healing. I mean, like I, I've seen this for the last 23 years, okay, way before I knew about polyvagal theory, by the way, because when I first started practicing, I didn't know about polyvagal theory, right? So it's very easy to, to attack and start nitpicking. Oh, you know, is the sympathetic nervous system active in that, at that point? And is that, is that, that minute part of it is still active? And yet things I have, like, I mean, right? So uh, personally, mm, I, I have heard that, but um, I know what I'm seeing. I, I know the results that people are getting. It's, it's that simple without going to the nth degree on the physiological aspect of what is active when it's active. The point is, if you are relaxed, if you're connected to yourself, if you're centered, you're connected to the breath, you're connected to the body, everything comes down you're gonna start healing. I mean, wow, yogis knew that. Um, they've known that for a very long time. I'm actually uh, finishing my yoga teacher training. They're not, you know, they're talking about that too. You know, it, it's, and it's something that people talked about way before Stephen Paul just came on the scene, yeah. right? So is this not something that I personally, I am going to take a lot of notice of uh, myself yeah. um, and I'm gonna just uh, doing what I'm doing because it works. Yeah, it works. OK, so, yeah, I yeah, guess this that's, was, this was actually your, your response is remarkably similar to what my response was when it was asked of me in the in the members group for the Energy Blueprint program. Someone posted this article and I, I read it and I, I basically said, you know what? Things like meditation, breathing practices, yoga, qigong, you know, on and on and on massage, lots of different types of modalities we could talk about. And there's, you know, dozens of others. Um, but these things work, period. We know they work. Now, one can- We have thousands we, and thousands of stu studies, probably yes. just on yoga alone. We, exactly. Obviously, we know exactly. that, right? So the, 
the debate over whether someone's proposed model of the physiological mechanisms of how they work is separate from the question of do the actual practical modalities work or not? And it's important to separate those out because the mechanisms may be discovered to be, hey, someone's model of the mechanisms, oh, that was wrong, but that doesn't invalidate the modalities. It just means, well, we already know they work, so let's find out what the better model is of the mechanisms of how they work, you know? And I think they're picking on the really fine detail of it. Overall, yeah. we know, everybody knows, because everybody's had the experience. When you are faced with a threat and you feel like you want to fight it or run away, Da, you know, you know, you are in a stress response, right? Everybody knows that because everybody's experienced this. So on this kind of more, um, you know, general level of the states that you switch between and then what actually brings you calm and what stresses you out. And then you, you need to feel how your body responds to that, blah, blah, blah. Right. And if you just if you work with that, you can't go wrong. And I think where they're taking it apart is on the in literally on the minute fine details. As I I um, said something in in the interview once with regarding Pori Vega theory, and somebody wrote me an email that but in this paper uh, it says that uh, it, your sympathetic nervous system is still active because it does something to your blood vessel, blah blah blah, even when right. you relax. Okay, and your point is, and your point is, I mean, so what? But yeah. ultimately. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, it's still true that if you in fight or flight, like a full blown, like not even full blown fight or flight, because if you have an emotional conflict and fighting it in, you're finding something in your head, that's fight or flight too. That without any shadow of a doubt, that's stress to your body and mind. So even something like that will shut down your detoxification power, you will shut down your gut. It's like none of that is priority because the priority is we in a threat situation and we need to deal with a threat. Right. So that's, that's, that's not changed. You know, yeah. no matter how they want to take it apart and nitpick, that's not changed. And overall, as you said, all the modalities that we've been using to calm the system down, the, the entire system, the, talking about mind and body, if we use that to calm it down, we're going to have a better result when it comes to healing, hands down, without any shadow of a doubt. And all the vagus nerve stimulation exercises that we always say, you know, these are the same things as yoga, meditation, mm. uh, being in nature, earthing, whatever, cold showers, whatever it is, whether it's hormetic or direct, right? It's, it works. We know it works. So to me personally, I'm not interested because that's just not good enough. You, you cannot like, you need to, you need to do better than that. If you're going to like topple it and yeah. then, then, you know, put people off. Um, it, it's a model at the end of the day, it's a model, right? Exactly. And, but it's a very helpful model for if somebody, I intuitively know it works and I have developed my right brain enough to be able to work with people intuitively a lot of the time. If I have a client in front of me, I never say, oh, that's what I'm going to do with the client. No, I work with what's, front, uh, what's in front of me because I am intuitive not enough to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I also like to satisfy my left brain and say, well, actually, yeah, how, you know, at least more or less, how does that work, right? So for people just, just to get an idea of, okay, if you're in fight or flight, this happens. If you're in freeze, this happens. That's what it kind of feels like. If you're relaxed, this happens, right? It's still really helpful for people to, uh, to just get their head around what, what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And as for the fine detail, I mean, ultimately, who cares, right? I'm not I mean, it's, like- It's a question for researchers in that field to to uncover the specifics of how that works but on a practical level working with clients you just need to know does this work or not and then you have useful models imperfect as they may be to explain to people conceptually what's happening right because on the same on the same by the same token right i talk a lot about transactional analysis you're talking about the child, parent, and adult ego states. So like I said, there's the, 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 the psyche divides into those different parts. You have those different aspects. And then you, if you get them nicely aligned and getting on with each other, you're going to have this perfect peace and calm. If they're fighting each other all the time, you're going to have emotional conflict. 
Now, somebody could come and say, well, that's not, you can't prove that that's the case. You can't prove that there's a parent and ego and child in your head. Yeah. Well, of course I can't, but it's just a very useful concept. Yes. And people respond really, really great to that. And you'll, if you work particularly doing some subconscious program, clearing or realigning or belief work, this is so useful. And yes, it's just a model. No, we can't prove that that actually exists in people's heads. Uh, but, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's the research side of it. And it's working with real individuals who want real results. And quite honestly, my clients really couldn't care less if somebody says, oh, it doesn't quite work that way because, you know, they get results. That's all they care about. Yeah, absolutely. So let's now shift into the practical side. So it, maybe if it's useful, and feel free not to answer it this way if it's not useful, but uh, if it's useful, let's say I'm coming to you as one of your clients and I have a lot of health problems, chronic health problems, and, um, and I suspect that emotional toxicity and trauma um, may be playing a role in my symptoms. What, what does it look like to work with you? What it, what's the process that you take people through in order to uh, sort of uh, uncover the, the root causes of their issues? And then what it, on a practical level, what, what kinds of therapeutic modalities do you use? Yeah, I actually no longer work with people one-to-one -one other than people who are actually doing my online programs. So that's another thing that I have proven and people said, no, it can't be done. Okay, well, it can be done. People can do their own work. Um, even my new book is called, it's called Sovereign Health Solution because my objective right now is to make people more sovereign, get people to be more sovereign, to do their own healing because we all can do that, right? And people need support, I get that, and they need guidance. But ultimately, uh, they can do a lot of their own work. So uh, what I start with is, first of all, I want to know um, how big, a puzzle, we, we talked about those different puzzle pieces and how big is this for you? Uh, so I've got this extensive questionnaire that I use. It utilizes um, the ACEs questions, but I've extended that to cover all the emotional toxicity symptoms as well. So it's like a two-part thing and it's something like 50 questions or whatever. That gives people quite a good idea of how big the piece is. So then what we'll do is, and that's basically how I guide in my program, we need to build a lot of awareness. So this is really the basis of all of this. Uh, you can't really go much further unless you just sitting in a therapist's office and the therapist just telling you what to do. But if you want to take the, the, the reins and really be in control of this own, uh, of, the, of your own process of emotional, psycho-emotional healing, you, you need to build self-awareness and a lot of it. So uh, we're looking um, at that point, we're looking at things like the Enneagram, we're looking at attachment adaptations, so the, the anxious, avoidant, and disorganized, whatever. So we're, we're looking at that, we're looking at the specific adaptations like perfectionism and people pleasing, blah, blah, blah. So that would be the Enneagram model. And I then look also at, uh, this is where I start employing transactional analysis because I wanna see uh, where people, child, ego state and parent and adult are what sort, of, what sort of dynamic do we have going on in your head, right? Because also we've got, uh, we've got the adult is the, the rational matter of fact, and then we've got the child and we've got the parent and we've got different aspects of child and parent. So we've got the critical parent, that's where people beat themselves up a lot, just give themselves a lot of criticism and they're very critical of others, blah, blah, blah. So we're gonna have a different dynamic um, depending on um, where those different states are. And that relates directly to childhood trauma. It relates directly to childhood trauma because your, um, your child and your parent ego state in particular, they essentially develop from the word go and they're literally where you, you store all that information. So in the parent, you store... Um, all the, the do's and don'ts and what people are telling you to do and what not to do, 
which is why it's called the parent. And then in the child ego state, it's really about the feeling and the emotions that the child will have in response to what's going on around them. And that's also stored. It's also stored. So, so when we have a really good picture of what's happening, then of course, that's where we can be more targeted with the approach, right? I do because obviously I, if I coach people on via my online programs and I just do Q and A's, but essentially, and people can email me and ask for help, whatever, that's fine. It's, it's there. I'm supporting like on the sideline, but because people are going to dive in and really do their own work, what I like to do is I like to be, build in some neurological resilience before we go like, okay, let's now take a deep um, dive into trauma. So that would be basically back to the vagus nerve and, and doing a lot of just like breathing exercises, um, also brain hemisphere balancing exercises, just to kind of bring a little bit more regulation into the nervous system. So people have more neurological resilience. So when they start doing the really deep traumas, when they're going into that, they have more resilience to do that. And so, when it comes to actual trauma work, I do a lot of, um, I, I want people to know exactly. So there's obviously exercises that we need to do if somebody is like a floating head or it's a floating head when they're really like disconnected from the body. Uh, we need to bring that back online because we're not gonna be able to feel anything um, trauma related if we have that complete disconnect. So there's obviously, some people already can drop right in the body, tap into their emotions and away they go. And then other people, because of their childhood, usually childhood dissociation, they won't be able to do that. So we need to help them connect, reconnect the head to the body so that they can actually do the work. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's kind of like also a step in this whole process model that I've created. I also want people to stop being afraid of feeling stuff. So when we know what emotions are feeling and why we're feeling them, so we know our emotional triggers, we can tell our fear from our anger, from our sadness, from our shame. Uh, it's a co completely different animal because suddenly a lot of stress is taken out of the equation just because somebody goes like, oh yeah, no, okay, yeah, I just felt this anxiety or oh, is that's to do with my I don't know mother-in-law coming over because she's going to trigger blah 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 something from childhood or whatever and that's it just changes everything it changes people become more brave and courageous about like hey okay now I, I know this now I, it's not going to phase me I can just go and do it and then when it comes to healing trauma my main modality uh, go to modality which i teach people um how to do because i'm um i've got a trainer uh, training in this um it's tavening techniques it's a psycho sensory modality it's a neuroscience based um psychosensory modality meaning that you stimulate the receptors on the skin to have a direct effect on the nervous system and that's to me, I've used so many trauma modalities over the years, and that's definitely my top go-to method. There's obviously other things I combine it with, because one thing about havening is you, you can, it lends itself very well to combining it with uh, hypnotherapy, visualizations, NLP, whatever it is, you can actually bring it into it. And when you do the, because uh, it's about stroking the receptors on the skin, when you do that and you act on the amygdala and you um, basically change the brainwave activity and through that you change the neurochemistry, essentially whatever you are doing, whatever modality you're doing, when you bring havening into it, you kind of further amplify the results. Mm -hmm. But obviously havening is a standalone modality to heal trauma. And that that's basically... And, I also bring uh, the um, energy field into it because like we said, you know, that's quite a big piece, uh, right? And some people just want to do vagus nerve work. <laughs> okay, that's very helpful. Uh, but the, really this picture is much bigger than that. And we need to in, um, uh, understand not just like, okay, our heart has got this electromagnetic activity and it's so great, much greater than the brain, blah, blah, blah. Obviously that's important, but we also need to understand the subtle body. 
And so I, I bring some energy uh, medicine modalities into that too, and just kind of blend it all together in the end. Nice. You mentioned at the beginning of this uh, that movement, getting the body involved is really important. And I know it sounds like havening technique is related to that, but can you elaborate on that topic of how the physical body and movement or touch and physical stuff relates to overcoming trauma and emotional toxicity? Yeah, the somatic element, isn't it? Um, and it is what I believe this is to do with, is to do with the fact that um, a lot of the trauma is actually stored in the fascia. Uh, so with, with havening, we literally, um, we've got this element of stroking the skin, right? So there's, that's definitely, there's a somatic component right there. But sometimes why this is important as well is because obviously from the, a very, very early time in life, like say, let's say, um, let's take my example again. So I had this trauma during pregnancy and then right after sort of birth and right after that, that obviously is a period of my life where I don't have any conscious memory from that no i had no conscious memories because you don't have conscious memories at that point so that's your implicit memory and that's that's more kind of tissue-based memory so if i was going and having my mother had this cesarean section and i was like grabbed and you know pulled out and then resuscitated and all of that right this is a lot of kind of this this trauma there to the tissue and of course, the fact that there is no conscious memory of that. So when you work with a technique that requires you to bring up the memory so you can deal with the memory, like, okay, well, we can't do it with that one. However, I can still use havening. And if I know there was a problem like that, and I, I, I have done this and it works really, really well. So I can sort of take myself in my imagination to that moment and imagine what it would have been like to be in the womb and be stressed because of the situation. And then you can apply uh, havening and act on the amygdala still, and it, it actually works really well. And um, I also use yoga. Uh, yoga therapy is very, very useful for getting into the fascia and, and really helping it release Sometimes, and so um, some people say it's in the muscle. Um, a lot of people say it's, it's not really in the muscle, it's in the fascia. I mean, whatever, it could be in both, right? It could be in both. But so trauma is encoded in the brain. So when you're talking about being stored in the brain, it's really, there is this encoding. There is something that happens to the brain. And what happens to the brain when you go undergo trauma is that the receptors on the surface of the amygdala neurons will come to the surface and they're like, stay there because they're ready because the brain says, hey, you survived it this time. But hey, what if this happens again? You need to like be ready next time, you need to be ready. And so then anything that remotely resembles the original event, and it could be something like really crazy, like you have a car accident, and there was a white car in the distance and your brain goes, oh, white car dangerous, right? And then you go down the street and you get triggered because you see a white car. Trauma. So there is something in the brain that happens and it's this encoding and it actually changes the, the neural, um, sort of the neural connections and the, the neurochemistry of what happens in your, in your head. So, and in your body. But also, we obviously have this element of trauma being stored in the tissues, and we also have the element of trauma being stored in our energy field, because we know ancestral trauma is a thing. So that's another thing that I look at. You need to do some ancestral clearing. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. So yeah, it, it, it's complex, but if you have a pathway, if you have a you know, the step by step method and you're just going through it people can do a lot of this for themselves if not most of them. if if you were going to leave people with i mean a, apart from buying your course and for people listening i i do recommend working with dr detko i think her work is excellent in this field um but if you're going to leave people with let's say your top three tips 
for addressing emotional toxicity or trauma in their life, in their journey to recover their health or optimize their health, what would be the top three things that you'd leave them with? So I do appreciate that not everybody will be like, whoa, yeah, I want to jump right in and do all this trauma work. I, I completely appreciate that most people go, okay, yeah, no, maybe now you're saying all those things. I recognize that that may be a piece for me, but eh, I'm not sure I want to go there. If you feel you don't quite want to jump with both feet, but you'd recognize that you have some of those triggers, that you have those anxieties and fears and those different things, start stabilizing your nervous system. Uh, start bringing more peace and calm into the system in whatever way it works for you. If it's exercise like yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong or whatever else, then that's great. If you don't like that, but you maybe really like being in nature or maybe gratitude journaling. That's a really, really amazing one. Um, whatever works for you. But what I would say is make sure that you don't necessarily go, hey, for two hours on Sunday, I'm just going to meditate, okay? Rather than that, even though that, that would be great, if you could do that, surely uh, that would be fantastic. However, most people can't really do that. So, and that's okay. You don't need to when you're first starting. But what you need to think about is asking yourself this question, Okay, in each and every moment, if you can be more aware of yourself and ask, okay, well, am I activated right now? Am I possibly like in fight or flight? Or am I feeling like completely, ah, like really nice and settled and peaceful and relaxed and grounded? If you can start asking yourself more of those questions more often, and then if you notice yourself being activated, slow, deep breathing, easy, cheap, effective right? Even something like that, because that's going to just, that's going to connect you, that's going to ground you, and that's going to calm you down. So obviously there's a ton and ton and ton of breathing techniques. The exhale is the important bit, the exhale. So you can even, not even so, so much focus on the inhale, but get yourself a straw and breathe out really slowly through, through a straw. And that is going to be activating the, the, you know, the ventral vagus, as we know. So we know that's true. So that would be the st stability, bring more stability into the system before you perhaps uh, start uh, jumping on, on uh, you know, trauma work if you're not feeling like this is quite what you want to do right, right yet. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, the third thing I would say is just move in some way. Human body was designed to move we're not designed to just sit on our ass all day long. And I know it can be challenging when you have all of these things that you need to get done. And then before you know it, you know, sometimes I can be guilty of that. Although I do make my yoga practice and if, if it's summertime, there's like weather is good, I'm out on the bike. It's like that has to be my priority. And so I would say just, Make that your priority, whatever it is, even if it is 20 minutes of gentle yoga practice in the morning, it's still phenomenal. We know from research that even 12 minutes of yoga can have very profound effect on your in inflammatory markers, just um, overall, how, it, how it's going to transform you over the time. But the last thing I would say is that, again, it, those things need to be a practice. So at some level, you do need to make them your priority because if you don't, you're going to be doing it every other week and you're like, well, it's not going to work so well. So if you, you don't have to be like super over the top about it and say, oh, okay, I'm doing it. And from today, I'm going to meditate for an hour every day. Well, again, if you can do that, that's amazing. However, if you could do that, you probably wouldn't have a chronic health issue <laughs> at this time because you would already have done it. So it's probably a barrier, but just like think at least starting with something really simple, like a restorative yoga. Even when you think like, oh, I can't be dealing with all those download dogs. It's just too much. Like think, think restorative, like just do something like really easy. And then when you start, you go, okay, well, that's, that's actually starting to feel nice. I'm going to do that now and I'm going to do that now, right? And there's so many 
um, even on YouTube, there's so many great um, little videos that you can follow. So there is really no excuse. The, the resources are plentiful. And just one thing I'm going to say, if somebody's not ready to do a big course with me, my new book is designed to lead you into that. And it does come with video and audio training. So the book is not just text because there's only so much you can teach in a written form. So I supported it with all sorts of videos and audios. And so, you know, so people can really kind of understand what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate in that Wonderful. way. Wonderful. When does your book come out? Is it already out? Uh, the book is out April 5th, but it's, uh, okay. if people pre-ordered it now, they get sent the digital version. So literally, you know, they're not going to get the paperback straight away, but they get the digital version straight away. So if they want to get into it right away, they can. Oh, excellent. Right. Okay, excellent. And where's the best place to get your book and to follow your work more broadly? So um, I uh, obviously it is on Amazon, but sometimes people don't like Amazon. So it's I think the publisher just put it, they put it on all, all platforms that you can think that you can book from. So that's pretty much available from, you know, your Barnes and Noble and Book Depository and all of those places. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's easy enough to find. Excellent, Dr. Deck. And where where's your website? Where's the uh, the best place to go for That's all your work? dr-eva.com. So dr-eva.com, dr-eva, and that's um, yeah, it's got my book right there on the front page, as you can imagine, because I'm so excited about it. Excellent, Dr. Deco. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really looked forward to this for a long time and you didn't disappoint. It was a pleasure and um, I look forward to the next time and good luck with your book launch. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me, Ari. Really appreciate it. I hope this was useful. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.